Welcome to the Conversations That Matter podcast. My name is John Harris, and I am honored to have with me today Trevor Loudon. Trevor, thank you so much for joining me on this uh, episode. Look, well, I look a pleasure, John. It's uh, great to catch up. Uh, now, Trevor's become a friend of mine uh, over the past few months. Uh, he has been featured on Glenn Beck and all sorts of conservative talk shows. Uh, Trevor, you write a lot. I just saw an article that you sent me that you wrote in the Epic Times, which was fantastic on critical race theory. Um, I know you're an author, you're a filmmaker. Where can people go to find out more about you or purchase your books? Look, go to trevorloudon.com, which is my daily blog, or go to um, Amazon and look at Enemies Within, and that's that's our movie that was... Um, that was done in 2016, and it looks at the, the heavy Marxist and Islamist penetration of the U.S. Congress and Senate. So we say there's about 100 members of the U.S. House that, that couldn't pass a background check. They're so involved in Marxist or Islamist groups. And our new project, uh, which will follow on from that, is Enemies Within the Church. And people can just go online and look at enemieswithinthechurch.com. Um, see a trailer, see what we're trying to do. Because um, if the enemies within politics was scary, <laughs> enemies within the church is even worse. These people have penetrated the churches so badly um, that, that, that it's going to have major impacts in this country for years to come. Yeah, Trevor, you're <laughs> one of the, the people that has helped me understand a little better. I, I thought I understood it, and um, but you've just clarified some things for me that – I was a little bit confused about when I was sitting in seminary and hearing some of the things that I was hearing. I thought, man, why, why are they taking this leftward turn? I even, before MLK 50 happened, I even said, this sounds like Marxism. I remember to a student friend of mine, I said, this is Marxism because it's exactly what I got in my secular uh, education. But, um, but you seem to have just a full picture on it. And uh, I know uh, some of the resources, one of the things that I know that uh, I think either you or Judd has sent to me is this KeyWiki uh, website, KeyWiki, I think, I think it's .com. Uh, dot, dot .org, actually. .org, so dot .org, KeyWiki.org. K-E-Y-W-I-K-I, dot .org, and it works, it's like a, a Wikipedia of the American left, both the secular left and the religious left. Yeah, so I started plugging in some names on that website, uh, authors that were displayed on the library shelf at the seminary I, I went to, things like that. And lo and behold, people were coming up <laughs> as communists, as you know, connected with communist groups. And I was just like, oh man, this is happening at an evangelical institution. They're marketing this. So um, the, the times are very serious right now. And I'm hoping you can help everyone as you've helped me explain what in the world is going on why is the church that i go to or the, the the institution seminary whatever why does it look different than it did even 10 years ago why can't we just get back to normal christianity so um if you would can we start at the beginning where where did the marxist infiltration start in the united states uh from the from the beginning well, well, probably the earliest infiltration was after the, 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 the there was a, a communist, an attempted communist revolution, uh, a Marxist revolution in Germany in 1848. Now that failed and the authorities cracked down on the revolutionaries. So where did they flee to? Uh, thousands of them actually fled to, the, fled to the United States, particularly the Midwest, Milwaukee, Chicago, that sort of area and and they um they helped to establish the republican party believe it or not in in wisconsin they were um many of them became generals in lincoln's army um so and many of them stayed in chicago where the communist party was formed in 1919 so there's been a marxist current in the american midwest and new york which which came with later immigrants um, in the 1880s, um, fleeing Russian pogroms, etc. There's been a huge Marxist influence in the American Midwest for a century and a half now. But um, with the foundation of the Communist Party USA in 1919, it obviously um, stepped up a notch. But the very first communist front in America 
was set up just before the Bolshevik Revolution. It was called the Methodist Committee for Social Action, set up by Harry Ward from Union Theological Seminary. And it was designed to bring communist ideas into American Protestant, Protestant, Protestantism. And so the, the Marxists decided very early on that though they hated religion, it was a lot better to use religion to spread Marxism than it was to directly come up against it. You know, they understood that to, to have a world revolution, America would have to be part of that. And to in the in the heart of America is Christianity. So if you're going to turn Americans towards Marxism, the Christian churches would have to be a major target. So right from the early 20s, uh, there was huge infiltration of the Christian churches, the Protestant churches in America. Um, it started in the 30s with the infiltration of the Catholic churches. Um, Bella Dodd, who was a Communist Party member, uh, returned to the Catholic faith, um, wrote, uh, talked extensively um, before uh, government committees in the 1930s, about the 40s, how she had helped to infiltrate hundreds of young communists into the Catholic priesthood. And uh, that's culminated now where you have a Marxist Pope and Pope Francis. But the one area that remained pure, the one area that you know was, was um, the branch of American uh, Christianity that remained pure for a long time was the evangelical movement. Now, if you're a Marxist revolutionary, and you saw these conservative evangelicals doing crazy things like electing President Ronald Reagan and Donald Trump, wouldn't you want to do something about that? Wouldn't you want to um, get inside the evangelical movement to shift that left? Because if you knew if you could do that, um, the whole American culture would shift left and American politics would shift left. And that is exactly what has been happening in the evangelical churches in the last 10 years, especially. And it's gone on steroids, um, basically, since the election of President Trump. They're going for the left are going full on to turn the evangelical churches left. Wow. Uh, that's all I can say. There was a recent article I know that came out about a Justice Democrat founder, uh, and I didn't really even know about this group. I knew there's so many leftist groups, you can't keep them all straight. But that this Justice Democrat founder, I guess, had a blog where he was explaining exactly what you just said. We need to infiltrate the evangelical institutions. There's a social justice movement going on there. Let's encourage it. Let's use this. Let's neutralize their vote or, or swing it to uh, be Democrat. And, um, and it's, it's frankly scary because this is a political movement and obviously there's theological ramifications because it comes from a false religion, which Marxism I think probably is, but it's, uh, it's in the church and it's, it's kind of like a, a virus that has sucked the soul out of true Christianity, the core doctrines of the faith. Um, I mean, to give one really quick example, I know there's a book that was, I, I covered this on the display shelf at Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary that said that Jesus couldn't really look past his Jewish male privilege. I mean, now he's God. So if that's true, then you're saying he is limited in some way that God should not be limited. And, and that's a, kind of a crazy idea to me that this would be touted, but it's because it comes from this Marxist worldview. And um, I'm, I'm so glad that you're fighting this and uh, the enemies within the church movies are going to fight this. Uh, yeah. Well, if you look at Justice Democrats, that is a front for democratic socialists of America, which you, we all know, um, you know, Ocasio-Cortez is a member. Um, they've got about 60,000 members in the country. They have a religious commission, many leading church members, theologians uh, are members of this group. Um, they, uh, the Communist Party USA, which is allied to democratic socialists of America, also has a religious commission. And I just want to backtrack and give a little example of um, one of the major Protestant um, Christians, theologians in the 20th century, and just a little bit of an impact that he had to, to show uh, the listeners just how one man can change a nation. 
one Marxist. Now, there was a guy called Joseph Fletcher. He was a top guy at Union Theological Seminary, I believe. He was also the head of the uh, one of the top people in the um, Episcopalian Theological Seminary. He was regarded as one of the leading Christian uh, Protestant theologians of the 20th century. Now, he is the man who gave us what we now know, know as um, situation ethics, right? And we all have all heard this term. It basically means anything is ethically justified as long as it's done in the spirit of love. Now, he wrote this book in 1966, and it transformed American Christianity. It was perfectly timed for the free love generation of the 60s and the, the hippie generation and the, and the influence of the, uh, of the, the Frankfurt School, which basically gave us um, political correctness. All of it came together in the 60s. And the idea was that forget the Ten Commandments. That's all old-fashioned stuff. Christian morality should be about love and only feminine love, the, the, the welcoming love of the mother where everything is okay, where everything's accepted, not the harsher love of the father who will kick your backside if you don't clean up your room or, um, you know, or disrespect your mother. You know, and the feminine love is all through the churches now. Masculine love has almost disappeared. No question. You know, and, and you need both. Any family needs masculine and feminine love. Every church needs masculine and feminine love. You need to be welcoming, but you also need to be chastising when necessary. You also need to be to make people accountable when necessary. So Joseph Fletcher introduced his concept Anything is okay as long as it's done in a spirit of love, um, which spread through the churches like crazy, spread through America, uh, through America like crazy. So most people now make their moral decisions not referencing the Ten Commandments, but is this okay uh, given the circumstances? You know, like um, every Christian pastor who says, well, I'm going to soft." You know, should I tell the preach the Bible as it's written, even the harsh bits, the tough bits, or should, in a spirit of love, I tone it down a little bit so I can bring more people into the church and, um, you know, get more people um, coming to know Jesus? Well, the, 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 old, the old paradigm would be you tell the truth and let the chips fall where they may, you know. The new paradigm is, no, let's just be soft sell. Let's soft soap it. Let's just act in the spirit of love. We'll welcome anybody into the church. We won't call them out for their sin. We won't um, chastise them in any way. That is situation ethics. And that is American Christianity today. Now, we've got to understand Joseph Fletcher, after he did his damage, renounced Christianity, became an open atheist, he was a founder of Planned Parenthood, um, a founder of euthanasia societies. But what most people under, don't understand, right since the 1930s, he was actively involved with the Communist Party. He was very heavily involved with the Communist Party USA in Massachusetts. He worked with major Soviet fronts like the World Peace Council. His, he was involved in the 30s with the... Um, the Tenants Union in the South, which was a Communist Party front. He was involved in union, communist union activism. The man was a communist. But as a leading Protestant theologian, he transformed American Christianity in a not very good way. So I just want to give a little bit of a background how the moral underpinning of Christianity has already been transformed by an actual communist. And now you have got Marxists in the evangelical churches promoting critical race theory, promoting uh, social justice, promoting welcoming of refugees, um, Islamic refugees, promoting illegal immigration amnesty, all Marxist programs. And it's dressed as Christianity and it is transforming the evangelical churches um, and turning them into clones of the larger Protest of the old traditional Protestant denominations, which are mostly the Communist Party at prayer now. 
Wow. That is certainly incredible to think of. Uh, and I did not have a name for this a couple years ago. I was a you know, praise and worship leader at a church. So I, I knew about the Christian music that was out there, the industry uh, that, that, you know, cranks out the, the music for worship, the music for Christians at home. A, a lot of these stations, Caleb, I guess would be one of them. I always thought <laughs> there's something wrong with, with the music that's being cranked out because so much of it is exactly what you just said. It is just this kind of squishy, feminized, even the, the men, um, without getting too deep into this, but the men sound feminine to me, a lot of them that sing this type of music. And it is it, sometimes like it's, it's like an adolescent boy whispering sweet nothings in my ear, uh, you know, and, I could help help you hear onward Christian soldiers. Exactly. Exactly. You know, you know those masculine you know, Christianity has a masculine side, or it used to have a masculine side. It was the side that fought the Civil War. It was the it was the side that, that ended slavery. It was the side the missionaries. that shut up the missionaries yeah. who risked everything, who risked their lives to go into some of the most horrible places on the planet. Right. With, great courage and 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 now this is oh let's just love everybody <laughs> it's just it's you cannot criticize people that would be unwelcoming you know and unaccepting that's god is love jesus is love well yeah but remember that love has two sides right you know just like your mother and father your mother loves you she'll accept you she'll put up with your indiscretions your father if he's a real man will kick your backside if you need it and he did my backside was kicked <laughs> well i'm sure you deserve i'm sure you're a better man for it today yes. and the same with the churches there has to be both sides of love and american christianity is now largely a feminized form of christianity which is which is betraying the, the core message yeah, so th this is interesting. I want to put the, the puzzle pieces together to get to where we are because probably not everyone can see the jump from the situational ethics to critical race theory and everything. Um, I, I know this just being a, sort of an insider in evangelicalism. Most churches don't do church discipline. That was dropped years ago. Of course, the music industry is very feminized. The, the, what pastors are preaching now, very positive uh, for the most part. Now, there are exceptions, obviously, but uh, it's, it's, uh, talking about sin, the serious nature of sin. I mean, I can't believe how many Christians that I know don't think things like premarital sex are a big deal. And I, obviously there's forgiveness for that, but to think that it's God doesn't even care about it uh, that much, that he's more concerned with your, your prideful attitude or so forth. Um, it, it, it that, that's already kind of happened. Moving forward, you know, now, now we last few years, there's been an influx of this neo-Marxist movement. I'm hearing terms now like white privilege. Um, I mean, you mentioned uh, welcoming uh, refugees, uh, the Me Too movement, uh, so f feminism, uh, empowering women, that's another term. Um, I hear, now I don't know if this makes it to the, the chart of the Marxist terms, but Human flourishing is now all of a sudden mentioned a lot. Um, gospel issue, immigration's a gospel issue, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, th th there's a lot, there's a new vocabulary, engaging culture. So I, I was hoping that you could maybe tell us, okay, what, where did all this come from? Where did, uh, let's, let's start with um, white privilege. What is that and how did that make its way into the church? White Privilege was founded by a guy called Ted Allen, who was a, a, a pro-Maoist member of the Communist Party in the 60s. He left the Communist Party to form the Provisional Organizing Committee. He was the pioneer of white privilege. It was further developed by a man called Noel Ignatin, sometimes known as Noel Ignatiev. He was another Maoist communist. And he introduced this, he was, he became, this movement became part of the, the doctrine, central doctrine of the Freedom Road Socialist Organization, which is the main Maoist Communist Party in this country. They just changed their name two months ago to Liberation Road. They're very active in North Carolina. Um, some of the people in the churches in North Carolina overlap with these people, actually. But the idea was white privilege. See, the thing is, 
most of us would think of racism as a personal failing. It is a, a lack of where, where we judge people by their skin color rather than the content of their character. It's a, you know, you see somebody of a different race, you automatically you react in a negative way. That's how we would see racism. Right. But, but critical race, but no, white privilege sees it differently. Only white people can be racist because racism is an intrinsic part of capitalism. And it's part of an intrinsic part of the dominant culture. If you do not have power, you can only be racist if you have power, if you have the power to dominate. If you are part of the, a, a subclass or a subculture or a um, non-dominant race, you cannot be racist in, in, in these terms, in, in white privilege terms. So therefore, to end racism, we must overturn the dominant culture. We must overturn capitalism. The 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 term the 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 um the term white privilege comes directly from the Freedom Road Socialist Organization. Comes directly from a pro-Chinese communist group, and it is pumped up by guys like Christian Smith and others who uh, wrote the famous book that's now being used all over the country, um, and and. You know, White Freedom Road Socialist Organization, coincidentally, is also the group that gave us Black Lives Matter. That is a front for that organization. Now, there was a, um, it's going to be in our movie, actually, uh, Enemies Within the Church, is a, a little clip with Michelle Higgins. She is a, a black pastor from St. Louis, Missouri. There's an evangelical convention of young teenage evangelicals in, in St. Louis. And all these young Christians are fired up. And Michelle Higgins gets up there and tells them that the thing that God wants them to do more than anything else is to end white privilege. And this is how you get to Jesus. This is, this is now an intrinsic part of Christianity. Well, Michelle Higgins is a member of the Organization for Black Struggle which is a front group for the Freedom Road Socialist Organization. These were the people behind the rioting in Ferguson a few years ago. So these young, even, young teenage evangelicals are now all fired up about critical race theory and ending white privilege, which is a 100% um, derivation of pro-Chinese Marxism-Leninism. And this has been sold to them as Christianity. <sighs> it's so frustrating. <laughs> it really is. Because uh, blatantly anti-Christian, if you really truly believe what the Bible says, you know, that you're not going to adopt those ideas. Uh, I wanted to highlight something real quick. Uh, on the website, Enemies Within the Church, uh, there's an article up now uh, that was just posted last night called Why is Crew? Echoing Democratic Party talking points. Crew used to be called Campus Crusade. For Christ, yeah. Right. And I think the example you just gave of, of this young lady, she was in, I think, speaking for an intervarsity group, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, crew is kind of on that level. They're, they're one of the other big campus ministries. And they just held their national conference uh, or international conference. And they had a keynote uh, speaker, Sandra Van Opstel. And some of the things that she said were absolutely incredible, and they go along with what you just uh, told us. Uh, she talks about American exceptionalism, racist structures, greed, idolatry. These are the things the church is just complicit in, and the church has to stop being complicit if they want young people to stick in the, to, to remain in the church. And, and one of the most disturbing things was she said she studied the book of Amos for 10 years. And then she went to seminary, learned Hebrew, studied the book of Amos, you know, in the Old Testament. And she didn't really quite understand it completely, though. She, she, she saw Amos differently after she started reading it through the lens of the oppressed, meaning she went and did prison ministry, and the inmates showed her that this, and I'm going to quote, in the book of Amos, over and over again, he tells us that trampling on the poor through purchasing through companies that exploit workers and harm and endanger human lives and cause war for our luxurious jewels and our electronic batteries is not worship. Now, I've read the book of Amos many times, 
I don't remember that in the book of Amos. No, I'm sure. <laughs> and, and I don't think credit, credit, I don't think ending white privilege was the 11th commandment either. No. You know, the, the, look, this is pure 100% Marxism. There's no other word for it. This is revolutionary Marxism. And they put a little bit of Christian terminology on top of it. And uh, they try and sell it to, to Christians oh. as, a, as, a, as a tool for, for furthering the faith. Now she it says, is- exactly, I, I just want to cut you off real quick. She says, God so loved the world, not just the people in the world. Jesus came to start a revolution against injustice. That was posted on the Crew website as a direct quote from her. And Crew used to be one of the main conservative evangelical uh, groups in the country, reaching out to young Christians. Um, and now it's to the left. Now it is echoing not just Democratic Party policies, but Marxist concepts. And this is, must be shocking to the donors out there who support Crew and, have, and, and remember being in you know, Campus Crusade for Christ back in the 70s or 80s, when it was a very um, straight up conservative Christian organization. The same thing has happened to World Vision, for instance, which was once a very conservative Christian charity. The Marxists used to hate World Vision because of its work spreading the gospel in the third world. Now, uh, World Vision was caught recently uh, giving money to Hamas, the, the, the communist terrorists in Palestine. I did not know that. So, you know, World Vision is very much to the left. Many of the traditional Christian charities out there and organizations that people are still donating money to, thinking they're sound organizations, have very much been taken over by, by Marxists. You know, what, what, you know, what do Marxists want? They want influence and money. The Christian church has got a lot of both. Wouldn't you want to get into the Christian churches and use their influence to further your cause and, and, and siphon off their money to promote it? If you were a good revolutionary, what would you do? It's the biggest target in the country, most influential target in the country. Yeah, that's truly really amazing. I wanted to ask you uh, another question because there are objections out there. They might hear what you're saying and say, well, look, I'm against Marxism. Uh, I, I think that's, that's a horrible ideology, but uh, we can use critical race theory, intersectionality, which I know we haven't defined those things quite yet, but we can use those things as analytical tools, and that's perfectly fine, which is what Re- Resolution 9 said, which is what I've been told by professors at Southeastern who can't seem to, to you know, they, they can't fathom that they would be Marxists. Uh, but yet here they are using these analytical tools. What do you say to that? I know you wrote an article on this. Well, critical race theory is basically the extension, and this was, as you say, passed as part of the Southern Baptist platform at their recent theory, you know, um, pushed by, uh, by Walter Strickland, amongst others. Now, critical race theory is basically applying, see, Marx, original Marxism was all about the class struggle. It was the workers against the capitalist bosses, the but critical race theory extends Marxist concepts into race. So it is not just workers against bosses, it is oppressed nationalities against the dominant culture, white capitalism. And intersectionality says that you can't just compartmentalize the class struggle with the race struggle. You've got to add in the sexual struggles, women's struggle, the gay, the gay rights struggle, all of them are all of them intersect so the real enemy is not just capitalism it's white heterosexist um homophobic capitalism it's white racist sexist homophobic capitalism so therefore to end these sins to end the sin of racism and the sin of homophobia and the sin of sexism we have to end white capitalism. In other words, we have to downgrade and overturn the dominant culture. This is just extending the concept of Marxist revolution into the racial and gender and, um, you know, LGBTQ fields as well. All it is, is it's just Marxism extended. And the, and the, 
the prime movers of critical race theory were one James Cohn, who was a, an active supporter of Democratic Socialists of America, worked with many of their religious activists, went to Cuba in 1984 with meetings of several Soviet front groups. And one of his, um, one of the people who went with him was Jeremiah Wright, the famous pastor of uh, Barack Obama, famous for his statement, down with KKK America. Yeah. And, um, so he, James Cohn wrote books like, you know, what does, what does, um, what does Marxism have to, what does black Marxism have to teach Christianity? He wrote books on, on, on liberation theology, which is just Marxism with a Christian veneer. The other main fund, main founder of this idea, critical race theory was a man called Derek Bell, who was a Harvard law professor uh, a mentor to Barack Obama again, and a member of, uh, used to write for Freedom Ways, which was a Communist Party uh, publication aimed at the black community, which was subsidized by both the Soviet Communist Parties and the Chinese Communist Parties. Derek Bell was also a member of the uh, Association of Black Lawyers, which was affiliated to the International Association of Democratic Lawyers, a Soviet front, and openly stated it was the legal arm of the Black Revolution, and they stood in solidarity with rifle-toting Black revolutionaries. Critical race theory is 100% a communist tactic. What it says is racism is capitalism, Racism is white supremacy. To end racism, we got to end capitalism. We have to have a revolution to overturn the society. So if the Southern Baptists believe that um, racially divisive Marxism is a tool for analysing society, this is just absolutely delusional. This is Marxism, 100% revolutionary doctrine with a little bit of a Christian veneer, and I mean a very little fig leaf of Christianity attached to it, actually now, in doc now part of the Southern Baptist um, tool book, you know, is it's adopted as part of Southern Baptist analysis. That shows that the Southern Baptist is willingly accepting Marxism. Willingly, revolutionary doctrine. There is no. This I'm going to be completely unequivocal about this. This is purely revolutionary Marxism, and the Southern Baptists, under Walter Strickland and J. D. Greer and others, seem to think this is just fine and dandy. That seems to go along with a controversy that happened last week over this. There's a, a documentary that was supposed to come out by Founders Ministries, which Tom Askell, who actually opposed that resolution, his ministry. Yes, very, very bravely from Coral Gables in Florida. He said at the convention, the, this doctrine is rooted in philosophies incompatible with Christianity, and he was 100% right. And, of course, he was <clears throat> voted down, and now there's this documentary that they want to put out, and they put out a trailer for it about, a, I don't know, a week and a half ago, and immediately four seminary presidents other big wigs in the southern baptist convention came came down on them that this is divisive this is wrong and of course you know none of this ever happened when critical race theory like mlk 50 revoice uh you know etc 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 but but when you challenge that there, there was this backlash and after that backlash occurred uh some folks started pointing out that matthew hall who was the provost at southern baptist theological seminary Al Mohler's right-hand man, essentially. I mean, he'll take over for Al Mohler in all likelihood. Uh, he it was filmed. Uh, now, I, I think some of these recordings are a year ago, uh, maybe a few years ago, but th there's multiple recordings. I've seen about four or five uh, articles or recordings of Matthew Hall promoting the ideas that you just said. And then one of them in particular, which went viral, which they, they, they deleted when it went viral, he says, I am a white supremacist, essentially. He says, I, you know, he's a white man. He says, I'm a white supremacist. I'm a racist. I'll always struggle with white supremacism. I'll always struggle with racism because of who I am. And that, I think, shocked a lot of Christians when they saw that. It's like, who in the world would, 
would, would have a white supremacist as the provost of the seminary, but I don't think he meant. No, he, he doesn't mean he's a white supremacist. What he means is he is imbued with the white capitalist um, culture. He's an unconscious racist. And this is what, um, you know, white privilege means. Doesn't matter who you are. You can be married to a black person. You can have black children. As long as you're white, you're an unconscious racist because you're a part of the white capitalist privileged class. And this is imbued in you. This is, a, this is the original sin, right? This is part of who you are. So as long as you're white, you're always going to have to struggle with racism, that you are a white supremacist. So he is saying, I accept the tenets of, of white privilege. I accept the central tenets of Marxist um, critical race theory. I am effectively a tool of Marxism. That is what he is saying. And I have read some of his stuff. I've looked at some of his podcasts and he is 100% on board with this agenda. And as you say, he may become the top man in the, in the Southern Baptists. The most, in, the, you know, this is, the guy is a Marxist. Whether he would consciously say he's a Marxist might be a different thing, but he is absolutely imbued with, with critical race theory, uh, white privilege, Marxist concepts. Yeah, amazing. He's been there for as many years, I think since 2000, and this has not been addressed. He's just climbed the ladder there under Al Mohler's watch, nonetheless. Look, Al Mohler has turned a very <laughs> blind eye to a whole bunch of this stuff. You know, Al Mohler who spoke recently at the Western Conservative Summit on, on uh, you know, which shocked me, on um, preserving religious liberty, has allowed this doctrine to become dominant now in the Southern Baptists. It, it, is, a, it, is, the theor it is the guiding parameter of the Southern Baptists, once the most conservative, you know, straight up orthodox, biblical, you know, Protestant de denomination in the country now is led by people imbued with Marxism. There's no way to soft sell that. And Trevor, what you're saying, I mean, I think your analysis is gold on all of this. I want to zoom out, take a, a, a real bird's eye view for a minute and see what you think of this. So situational ethics, pietism, uh, that kind of, I think, neutralized the church as far as... Yep. It gutted it. It, it. The moral, the ethical framework was taken down, and it was just this general love, 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 this vague kind of emotionally charged concept, which isn't really a biblical love. And then now, it, once it was broken down, the, the ethical framework of the church, now it is being built up again in a Marxist framework. That's what I see, because now, as you just rightly pointed out, there are commands. Thou shalt not be a racist. Thou shalt not be a sexist. Thou shalt yeah. not be a homophobic. Uh, the, there is a very strong moral code now. And if you deviate from, from that, the, the long knives will come out for you. Is, is that the design from the beginning was to you know, take well, to out the de tradition? Deconstruct. Deconstruct. And I think you have now anal analyzed it beautifully. You know, pietism was the concept you know, that came from the, just after the Reformation in Germany, that the Christians should not be involved in the civic affairs of their nation. And that has spread right when, the, when these the Lutherans and German Christians came to America in the Midwest, that spread to American Christianity. So it neutralized Christianity. Um, behind that became Marxism. That's how you were, that's how fascism arose in Germany because the German churches were so gutless and so neutralized, they didn't make a stand against it. You know, they accepted that they, they put swastikas in their churches. So what you've got now is a, a, is a Christianity that's been very watered down, which has turned a lot of people off because young Christians, they want to go into church. They want to be idealistic. They want to stand for something. Right. They want to stand for principles. And they're listening to their pastor who's as weak and soppy as you could possibly imagine. And that does not inspire them. So what comes in? Marxism comes in. Let's be Christians. Let's fight global warming. Let's stand on the border and welcome invading refugees. You know, um, 
immigrants across the border. Let's get all on board with ending white privilege. Let's get all on board with social justice. So this, I, so the churches have gone from being weak and soppy to now standing for something. But the problem is they're standing for exactly what Christianity is not. They're standing for the exact opposite. And all these young idealistic pastors who want to stand for something, who want to um, bring back some backbone to the church, are being fed these Marxist ideas, and they think that they are restoring the church by doing this. No, they are not. They are dragging the church to complete destruction. Um, and and uh, it's very sad, but it's very clever. It's by design, you know. See what they're doing. What they're doing electorally right now. And you mentioned it before. Uh, that guy from the Justice Democrats, which, as I said, is a front for Democratic Socialists of America. Let's, if we can't, let's neutralise the evangelicals' conservative vote. Let's neutralise the vote, and if we can, get them voting Democrat. So the first thing is neutralise them. Wean them off the Republican Party, wean them off conservatism. That's the first step. Then, if we can, we actually move them to the left. So the first step is break their allegiance to conservative or traditional Christian principles. Then we've neutralised them, and then we start to move them to the left. That's the way they go. That gentleman's name is Zach Exley, by the way. Zach Exley. The Justice Democrats is is heavily involved in, in the Democratic Socialists of America, which is more left wing than the Communist Party, which has which has ties to former East German communists, which has ties to Latin American communists, supports uh, Hugo, uh, the Maduro government in Venezuela, supports Cuba, and these Exley is in that milieu. And he is openly working to shift the Christian churches from the conservative movement to the left. Now, Andrew Breitbart used to have a great saying. He would say, uh, politics is downstream from culture. You know, the, polit the, the culture shapes the politics, but culture is downstream from religion. So if you can shift American Christianity to the left or at least neutralize its conservative base, you can change the culture of the nation and you can completely change the politics. You know, um, if we lose America, even if you're totally secular, even if you're an atheist, but you're a conservative, you should be concerned about this because this is going to shift American politics to the left. It's going to basically usher in a socialist America if it is not checked and counterbalanced. On that oh, note, <laughs> Um, you know, I, I so appreciate your work and the work that's going on at Enemies Within the Church. Uh, you can go to enemieswithinthechurch.com if you're listening or watching this and want to contribute to our efforts. Uh, I know, Trevor, I talked to Judd not too long ago, and we need a jump of change. So uh, if, if, if you can contribute to that effort, man, that would be really helpful. Uh, we can expose look, look, this. Yeah. Look, this movie, what this movie is going to do is draw a line. Because most American Christians are going to socialist churches and don't know it. They're sincere Christians who who want to be want to be good, who want to follow the Bible properly, and they're being fed a bill of goods. We need to show how this is happening, and we need to draw a clear contrast between biblical Christianity and socialist Marxist Christianity. And if people see the difference. I think we'll see a major, major change and a, and a rejuvenation of American Christianity. So if you can spare a few dollars, go to enemies within the church. You know, look, you put money into, you go to your Marxist churches every Sunday and put money in the collection plate. <laughs> go to enemieswithinthemovie.com and put some money there because this is going to do more to save American Christianity than anything else I can think of. And I'm not saying this to promote our own project. You know what we've found, John. You know, you've yes. seen it yourself in, in the seminary you went to, Southeastern. You saw the Marxism in there. You saw the young pastors, future pastors, swallowing Marxism. And they're going to be out there in the next few years spreading it 
all over the country. That's got to be stopped now. And this movie will draw a clear line in the sand and awaken people to what's happening. We'll actually make them woke in the true sense. <laughs> okay. Not the false Marxist sense that's, sense that's now being promoted. The two things to real quick <laughs> add to that. Uh, number one, uh, if you care about the gospel, you're a Christian and you know, you, for you, that's the main issue. I mean, that's kind of what got me into this. We, we will be sharing the true message of Christianity, redemption in Christ for real sins that the Bible actually calls sins for individuals, not uh, systemic you know, injustices, but individuals who sin out of their human hearts, which is what the Bible teaches. We're going to share that message that Christ can forgive that, that you can be made new and have the Holy Spirit. And so, so that message is in there, uh, the true message. And then the other thing... Um, I wanted to mention, I totally forgot because it slipped my mind, but I'm sure it was important. Uh, man, Trevor, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, I remember what it was now. Um, some of the most damning information. We, I mean, we've released some stuff and I, the reactions have been interesting uh, to say the least. Um, and I'll just leave that there. Some of the most damning information has yet to be released. We're sitting on it for this film. Yeah. I just want people to know that. So. Uh, we, haven't Trevor, fired, we haven't fired all our guns off. Oh, yet. no, no. The big ones are, are being saved. Uh, so, Trevor, I really appreciate you joining me. I'm going to ask you a fun question kind of at the end. Uh, I know you and I have talked a lot about uh, our love for barbecue and um, yeah, other see. food. So, what, you know, you said, I think you told me your favorite food is barbecue, genre of food. Is that right? Yeah, look, especially beef brisket, burnt ends of beef, beef brisket, uh, oh, are one wow. of the greatest gifts we have. I'm, yeah, I'm getting hungry. Now, yeah, what's your favorite style? I don't know if you're familiar. There's Texas style and Memphis style and Carolina, North and South. So what do you like? Look, I would probably have to say Texan style, beef brisket, you know. Look, I've been to some of these little cinder block, you know, um, barbecue houses, barbecue places in the back blocks of Texas. You know, you sit there and there's all these guys with ZZ top beards <laughs> and overalls, you know, around you. I've and been there too. Thing you know, and you just get this big pile of brisket with all these burnt ends, and it's just, smoked. Yeah, oh, it's just divine. It's just heaven. They don't have that in New Zealand, do they? No, they don't. See, barbecue in New Zealand is just you put a chop on a on a grill. You know, okay. you put a, beef, a a sausage on a grill. I didn't know what barbecue actually meant until I came here. And it's been one of the great joys of coming to America is having barbecue, you know. I, I told my parents the other day, I was talking to them about this project a little bit. And I said, you know, it seems like everything I love is being destroyed. It's kind of discouraging. The Boy Scouts is destroyed. I love the Boy Scouts. You know, I was, I was involved in that. The church is now being attacked. Look, the Communist Party was trying to take the Boy Scouts down in the 20s. Oh, really? Okay. Because of its patriotism, its, its American values, all the good things about the Boy Scouts. Yeah. Now pretty much been destroyed, and the Marxists are behind it. So, so yeah, you have the you know, Boy Scouts, you have the American Christianity, conservatism, um, even just being proud of our history. Just everything's going away. And I said they haven't taken barbecue yet. And I said if they ever lay a finger on it, I'm going to go ballistic. Like that's going to be, I'm going to lose it at that point. So well, look, I'll tell you, the next movement in the next few years will be anti meat. Yeah, so that's, I'll tell you that. So, so look, look, this is why we got to fight back. Yes, if you love your barbecue. We've got to save American youth. We've got to save barbecue. We've got to save <laughs> the important things we have to save and liberty. All right. And, Sounds and that, good. Well, do you want to be a socialist vegetarian, an atheist socialist vegetarian? Because that's what the left would like to have us. A soy boy. A soy boy. A soy boy, yeah. And you know, the soybean is so full of female hormone. Okay, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> just terrible stuff. Well, Trevor, thank you so much. Uh, people want to check you out. Which is great for females. It ain't good for guys. I just want to <laughs> emphasize that. Enemieswithinthechurch.com. Uh, Trevor Loudon. Was it TrevorLoudon.com? And uh, yeah, check Trevor's work out. He's got some good movies and material out there. Thank you, Trevor. Look, a pleasure, John. Great, great, uh, great interview. Thanks for your time. Right. God bless. <laughs>